Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Um, let's just start. So we're going to talk about defining and managing peripheral neuropathy. Can I have a show of hands if you guys feel comfortable? How many people in this room have peripheral neuropathy? All right, that's why you're here. How many people are a caregiver of someone with peripheral neuropathy? Good. How many people have ever seen a neurologist for their neuropathy? Okay. How many people have ever had an EMG? One of those, we'll talk more about what that is. So very few. Okay. Okay. Good. How many people would consider their neuropathy mild? How many moderate? How many severe? Okay. So quite a spectrum. Okay. Great. Uh, so what we'll do is we're going to just talk about what is peripheral neuropathy. Because I think so many few people have seen a neurologist, we can provide just some helpful information about what that means. I'll talk about how we evaluate and approach a neuropathy. And we'll talk about causes for neuropathy in transplant population. This will be somewhat chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, but there are many other reasons. And we'll talk about some management ideas, both medical and just some practical things um, uh, to think about. So what is neuropathy? So we think about it as dysfunction or disease of peripheral nerves. So here's just some pictures. And uh, let me see if this works. Yep, okay. So here is a nerve, and you can see there's all these little different bundles. And if you kind of zoom in on just one of those, you can see that there's an individual nerve here. The neuron is the kind of the machinery and the thinking portion and the control of the nerve is the neuron. Then you have the, the nerve axon itself. And all these little branches that go to individual sensory receptors or muscle or motor receptors. And the nerve, what's zoomed in on here is there's both the axon, which is the nerve fiber itself, and then there's the myelin. The myelin's the coating, the sheath around the nerve that helps the electricity going down the nerve to conduct in a rapid fashion. So we, we think about neuropathies as those that involve these nerve fiber itself or the ones that involve the coating around the nerve. And the nerve, you know, is not just an independent thing. It, it, it is connected to our central nervous system all the way up in the brain following down through the spinal cord, and that sends the signal through the nerve to tell us what to do, either to go up on our tiptoes, um, for balance, for how we feel, do we notice pain and temperature, all those signals are vastly connected all the way through the nervous system. If we, if we looked at your nerve under a microscope, if anyone's ever had a nerve biopsy, this is what we would see. So um, this is just a few fascicles, but if we took out your nerve, depending on what nerve we took out, we might see hundreds of these. And in each one of these bundles, are, you can see hundreds of different nerve fibers. So each of these little donuts is a nerve. And the dark rim around that is that myelin or that coating. And so this is what we're seeing under the microscope of your nerve. So how do you get nerve injury? It's just not one different mechanism. So you could compress the nerve and squeeze this myelin like a toothpaste effect, squeezing it. You could pull and, with traction. You can have even immune myelin or immune disorders that attack that myelin coating. You could have disconnection where it's pulled from its connection to the spinal cord. Or you can have the more common dying off where the nerve fiber degenerates, usually from its distal end up towards the cell body itself. So many different ways that that nerve can be injured. So what happens? Can the nerve repair? Well, that's the beautiful thing about the peripheral nervous system is that if you take away whatever's causing the neuropathy, theoretically there is an ability for the nerve to repair. So what happens? So here in this picture, you can see there's three different nerves. They're each going to different receptors. In this case, you could think about it being muscle fibers controlling your strength. And then let's say you lose one. So the one that provided all the connection to these muscles over here is now gone. Well, then what can happen is that the nerves um, near it can provide, you can see, innervation, collateral sprouting, we call it, to these other areas of muscle fiber and provide regeneration and now control what that nerve was lost. So neuropathy, as we see in this room, you know, it's common. It affects two to three people out of every 100, okay, so quite a lot. 
in about 8 out of 10 people over the age of 55. Okay, so that is a lot of people. Um, symptoms, um, uh, I'm sorry, that should be 8 out of 100. 8% over the age of 55. Still a high number, thinking about how different diseases affect us. So what do we do in the clinic when we see someone with neuropathy? You might think peripheral neuropathy, and you were describing it as pain. But for me, peripheral neuropathy can cause many different symptoms. So what are some of the symptoms? They can be sensory. So people, you might think about tingling or prickling sensation. Um, dead numbness, some people describe that as something being wrapped around the foot or they feel like they're walking on sponges. Does that resonate to anybody in here? Maybe something in the sock, like there's a pad. Um, a cold feeling, so people just describe their feet are cold. They may not feel cold to the touch even, but you feel like you always want to put socks on that they feel cold to you. A tightness, something constricting or wrapping around the foot. That can even be uncomfortable. Burning, like a sunburn. Um, shooting, stabbing pain. So it can be like an electrical shock or a knife-like pain. It can be in one spot, it can be radiating to another area. And then sensitivity to contact. So, you know, you, you, you shy away from the touch of your partner in the bed. You don't want the sheets rubbing against your feet. Um, all those things are really, you build yourself a tent to keep anything away from you or touching you at night. So not only can you have sensory symptoms, but we want to ask about weakness. Neuropathy can cause weakness. It can cause you not to be able to lift up your feet right. So when you're walking, you sound heavy-footed, like you're slapping your feet and um, coming down the hall. It can give you weakness in more what we call proximal muscles, like getting up from a chair, getting up from the toilet seat, going up and down stairs. It can cause trouble with strength in your hands, opening jars, dexterity with buttons, um, and even more shoulder lifting uh, strength as well. And then something we don't think about often, but that neuropathy can affect those automatic functions of your body that you don't think about every day. They just happen. So they can affect, you can affect your blood pressure control. So maybe when you stand up, you can feel lightheaded when you stand. Dry eyes and dry mouth. Again, these are complex systems, and so people may have this for other reasons, medications most commonly. Um, but the autonomics uh, does control lacrimation and salivation. So feeling full after just eating a few bites of food, you feel very bloated, or um, you may vomit you know, undigested food hours later. You can't digest well. Constipation, diarrhea, difficulty voiding. Um, not being able to sweat, and erectile dysfunction in men. So what do we do when we see someone? We're in a neurology office for neuropathy. We're going to do an examination. And so we're going to take a history about all those, those symptoms I talked to you about, but we're also going to look carefully at your feet. And there's always some features that sometimes are helpful to us. Um, this may be a, might be a person with a genetic neuropathy. They have very skinny legs and ankles, and they have what we could say is high arches and hammering or curling down of the toes. Um, some people with neuropathy can have significant color change to their feet. Like you see here, it looks like fire engine red. That looks painful. That is painful. Um, so those things are important for us. And then you'll have an examination that looks at all these different types of nerves. Um, and the different functions that each of the nerves have. So we'll look at touch, and we may test that, you know, maybe tactile with cotton or um, something similar. Um, vibration sensation, uh, how, and that is something we test with a tuning fork. We may test what we call your joint position. That helps with your balance. That helps you when you're standing still with your eyes closed. Um, we'll check how well you feel pain, the dreaded pin, if you've been tested in the neurology office, to see how well you can feel sharp and dull, and then temperature, cold and hot. So each of those is tests a different function of your nerves. There's different nerves for each of those different sensations. So neuropathy, can, as you can see, could be different for each person, depending on which of these different nerves it affects more. We'll test your strength and how well you, um, you do just testing, like, um, resistance of different activities, test your reflexes, and evaluate how you walk. Um, 
So what's important to us? So we kind of like to group neuropathies into patterns um, as physicians. And so we talk about whether the neuropathy is equal on both sides. Is it symmetric? Is it length dependent, meaning is it involving the feet more? And then it is, you know, closer up towards the hips. Is it involving the feet more than the hands? Because we, most commonly neuropathies affect the longest nerves. And so that's why the feet are most commonly affected. Um, and so we want to know, is it fit into that general category or is it something different than that? We want to know if it came on suddenly or really gradually and sedously, like it snuck up on you and you can't remember what day it started, but it was just there one day. And then the tempo, is it something that's gradually just puttering along, getting a little bit worse year by year, or is it something that's changing week to week? And then it's important to go over the medical history. There's lots of, we'll go over, there's lots of causes of neuropathy, and we can find some important clues there. Medications and family history. We know that one-third of undiagnosed peripheral neuropathies are actually genetic neuropathies, and so family history is something that people don't delve into often, and our relatives don't talk about it very much. So it takes some detective work, but that can often be an unrecognized cause. So... Just like we talked about fatigue a little bit ago, um, neuropathies of many different causes, you know, um, they can present with similar signs and symptoms, just like I think our colleagues talked about in the eye talk as well, is that there's only so many ways the nerves can react, just like there's so many ways the eyes can react to, to, to causes. And so many people with neuropathy present with similar signs and symptoms. So we talked about most common is length dependent, so when long nerves, and that's where neuropathy, have you ever heard of stocking glove sensory loss? Because it involves first the stockings, as they get worse, then you get this glove and stocking. So we kind of say mild, moderate, and severe, but um, in terms of how much of involvement of the body surface that is. And usually in most neuropathies, sensory is the most worst, the worst affected versus motor versus strength. So most patients have either loss of sensation or painful sensations or combination more than there is motor weakness. So what are some potential causes of neuropathy in the transplant population? Well, certainly in those who've had cancer, we talk about chemotherapy-induced neuropathy or CIPN. Uh, diabetes or impaired fasting glucose can be an a important cause. Patients can, in, with transplant can get a lot of steroids, which can cause some problems with the endocrine system and, and uh, glucose monitoring and glucose control. And so diabetes is the most common cause of neuropathy worldwide. And again, it's often a sensory predominant distal neuropathy. And there's increasing interest in the association with even just what we call borderline diabetes or impaired fasting glucose. And that's been associated not just with because of diabetes, but with other factors like obesity, lipid control, so people have high cholesterol, high lipids, uh, lack of exercise. Um, those things can all contribute in the impaired fasting glucose and an association with usually a painful sensory neuropathy. As I said, inherited causes um, affect about one-third of undiagnosed neuropathies. And we know that patients who had an undiagnosed neuropathy who get chemotherapy often have a worse neuropathy as a cause of that. And so it's important, you know, to some, be able to recognize some of those features about neuropathy before chemo as, you know, that can cause uh, worse symptoms. So in the transplant population, nutritional issues. Um, so often there's periods of time where people nutritionally are not as healthy and doing as well. And, um, and so B12 deficiency certainly can be associated with neuropathy. B6 deficiency rarely. Thiamine deficiency. So we uh, thought to think about the vitamins. Vitamin E can cause balance trouble. So all the vitamins important. Um, also, to think about the, the associated underlying disease the transplant was for if there was an associated disease, so things like myeloma or amyloid or um, lymphoma, you know, some of those diseases on a, their own can be associated with neuropathy. Kidney disease, when it's severe, so on dialysis um, with very poor kidney function, can be associated with neuropathy. Alcohol use. 
um, is probably under-recognized um, and under-discussed. And then there's rarely immune-mediated neuropathies that typically occur in the setting of the transplant that can, that can occur. So what tests do we do for diagnosis? So there are tests that we do that are aimed at what we call large nerve fiber function. So talking about those sensory tests that we do in the office, the ones that the tuning fork and how well you can feel vibration, and the balance fibers, the ones that help you stand with your feet together and your eyes closed, those are tested with um, what we call nerve conduction studies and electromyography, or what some people all together just refer to as getting an EMG, and I'll show you some pictures of that. Then there are also tests that we do that are aimed at, quote, small fiber function and how well people feel pain and temperature and those autonomic functions, those automatic functions you don't think about. So um, we'll go through those. Those are the autonomic testing and sometimes a skin biopsy. And then sometimes we, even if we're really unsure or it's a rapidly progressive neuropathy, we even sometimes take a whole nerve and do a biopsy. So here's what nerve conduction studies and EMG look like. So in the top picture, what you see is that a patient has some electrodes taped to the skin over the hand. And then this is a little stimulator that gives an electrical shock. And we shock over different motor and sensory nerves to assess how well they're working. They also tell us, is the problem associated with that nerve fiber or is it that coating around the nerve? So we get some valuable information about the neuropathy from those tests. The second part of the test is the physician would put a needle into the muscle, a small needle, and listen to your muscle activity. Um, and that assesses for how, how far widespread is the neuropathy. Is it a neuropathy or something else, and how severe is it? So these two parts of this test are always usually done together. They go hand in hand and provide important um, information together. Now, does every person need an EMG who has a neuropathy? Not every person. I would say, you know, if it's diabetes and it's clear there's other complications of diabetes, not every person maybe needs one. If it's clear it's related to chemotherapy and it's mild and you're doing well, maybe not. But, it's, you know, if it's a problem for you and you're looking for more assessment, that's a test that you might commonly have. Then we talk about autonomic testing. So um, one thing we can do is what's called autonomic reflex screen, and there are several parts to that test, and I'm showing some of those here. Um, but we can measure how well you sweat. These little capsules are put on the skin and they capture your sweat. And we, we can calculate how much there is and if that's normal for your age and gender and height and weight. Um, we can assess how well your, your heart rate should vary when you take a deep breath. You breathe in and out, your heart rate gets faster and slower. And that's controlled by something called your vagus nerve. And that can be affected in certain types of neuropathy. And so we can look at that. We can have you, um, if you think about what's called a valsalva maneuver, when you bear down to have a bowel movement or you blow into a straw and you, you bear down, we can look at your blood pressure and your heart rate during that. That gives us some important information. And then this picture is showing a tilt table. We'd be lying flat and then you'd be tilted up and we would check your heart rate and blood pressure. And so all those things are under uh, control of the autonomic nervous system and can be affected in some neuropathies. Sometimes in painful, burning feet, small, what we call small fiber neuropathies, patients might get what's called a skin biopsy. Here it's like a little punch biopsy. And what we can do on that is we look at the nerve fibers as they cross the skin layers, and we count those. And that can tell us if there's loss of nerve fibers. It doesn't tell us as much about why. It can give us a little bit of information uh, regarding that. Then sometimes, as we said, we can do rarely a whole nerve biopsy where we can look at the nerve under the microscope and look more detailed for certain causes. But we only use that in, rare, in more rare situations. So let's just switch and talk about chemotherapy-induced uh, peripheral neuropathy. So we know by some studies that it occurs in probably 30 to 40 percent of patients, although in, in, can occur in up to 70 percent of patients receiving some agents. There's many agents that can cause neuropathy. Some of the most common ones we see, um, and especially in this group of uh, patients, is bortezomib or Velcade, uh, vincristine, the platinum agents, carboplatinum, cisplatinum, oxyplatinum, taxols, paclitaxol, taxol. Those are some of the most common. 
most causes, uh, most chemotherapy-induced neuropathies cause that stocking glove where we saw the feet first as it's more severe, progresses up to the knees and to the hands. And it's most often painful. So you guys may be able to relate to that, I would imagine, that kind of painful, sometimes burning, sharp shooting, sensitivity. The good news is that most get better when you stop the medication. But even for some of these agents, they can actually worsen for some time after you stop it. It's called coasting. And so that can sometimes be concerning to the physicians who are seeing you is why is it getting worse? We stopped the medication. But there are some agents that we do see that with. And um, there's, you know, great research and, and discussion into are these preventable? So are there certain kind of genetic factors that maybe make some people more likely to get it? Are there enzymes that we can try to block or um, accentuate that might help prevent some of these complications? And we can talk about are there some safe medications out there that you might use in this situation? And then, um, so in other causes, so we talked about the diabetes again being the most common cause. Um, and again, it's often a painful sensory neuropathy. Inherited being under-recognized, not often reported. You know, you have to, patients and, and family members in generations above ours, it's a lot of other things going on in their lives that probably uh, made this seem less consequential, you know, wars and lots of depression and, and things like that. Um, and uh, so it's hard sometimes to get that history. Maybe it was as simple as mom soaked her feet a lot in water, you know, and you notice they were painful because of that or walked with a cane. Um, but we know that that can worsen chemotherapy toxicity, neuropathy. Uh, we talked about B12 and the kidney disease and then the others. So again, these are sometimes what we might see in someone with an inherited neuropathy and what we're going to look for is potentially some features. So what are some treatments for these particular conditions? Well, obviously chemotherapy, we want to stop the offending agent if possible. And sometimes that's not always possible. We have, you know, you're also trying to treat the underlying disease and what's important for managing that. Um, diabetes, the most important thing to do for diabetic neuropathy is to control the blood sugar. And, and that's especially true in type 1 diabetics where blood sugar control is the most important. And type 2 diabetes, it's probably not that simple. It's not just blood sugar control. It's weight loss. It's cholesterol control. It's exercise. All those things being really more important than just the blood sugar itself, that number. I want to make sure we've looked at and replaced nutritional deficiencies and talked about diet. Um, correcting kidney failure, so dialyzing. Um, stopping alcohol. And, and if it's the rare immune type, there's certain types of immune treatments, things like steroids or other immune therapies um, that can be used in those rare types of neuropathies. So let's talk about symptomatic treatment. So, what's, so when you're looking at symptomatic treatment for neuropathy pain, you want to assess the pain and really establish that it's neuropathic pain. So there's lots of different types of pain, musculoskeletal pain, um, and so neuropathic pain will have, you know, certain features. One is that it's usually continuous. It's not really dependent on position or um, activity, although activity can certainly make it worse, but burning, icy, intense tightness. Or it can be paroxysmal, meaning that once in a while, coming and going, lancinating, jabbing, or shooting. And then what we call allodynia, which is that inappropriate sensation of pain to something that shouldn't be painful, like the bed sheets. They shouldn't hurt your feet. Your clothes shouldn't, rubbing against your skin should not be painful. Um, so those are all different types of neuropathic pain. So what we try to do is really establish the cause, identify relevant other think comorbidities or other diseases that may affect the medication choices that we make. Um, and uh, so heart, kidney, liver disease, coexisting depression, we can kind of sometimes target both of those with our treatments. And then we want to really work with you and try to explain the diagnosis and the treatment plan and establish realistic expectations. Many pain treatments fail, I think, because of expectations sometimes. We don't know what to expect in terms of how well will this control my pain. And I would say, unfortunately, the data would suggest that 
Um, a good response to pain is 50% you know, reduction in pain scores. And so most of these treatments really will not take away the pain, but hope to modify it so that you can be more active and make it less of the, um, in the forefront of your mind so that you can go about and have an improved quality of life. So why do treatments fail? One is because sometimes we don't, you know, the diagnosis isn't correct as to what type of pain. Maybe the wrong medications are used or they're underdosed. Um, sometimes too rapid of titration leading to side effects, so they're discontinued too early. Not, you know, assessing and addressing other psychological or rehab needs that would be helpful, balance and all those things. Not following patients up and not, again, educating on what to expect from these medications. So when I see a patient with neuropathy, um, I like to talk about what are the first-line treatments. You know, uh, patients are already on a lot of medications and so not sometimes you worry about interactions and other side effects and trying to minimize if we can. And so what are some simple things? Soaking the feet in cool water for those painful neuropathies, the burning feet, especially before bedtime can be really helpful. Not ice cold, cool. Ten minutes, dry the feet off, especially for bed, can really um, try to uh, the pain receptors that have these uh, temperature control, the temperature related pain receptors can be modified with this and that can be quite helpful, help patients get to sleep and we know how important sleep is. Over the counter pain medications, Tylenol, ibuprofen, you know, um, acetaminophen, those types of pain medications can be helpful for neuropathic pain when it's mild. Then we talk about topical agents. So we're still trying to do things that aren't as systemically um, uh, absorbed, so to lessen other side effects. So when symptoms are really confined to a small area, say just the feet, um, then these topical agents can work well. So sometimes lidocaine patches or gels. Um, the patch, I would say the only hard part about it is hard to put on your feet and walk and be active. So there's gels and creams that you can make with lidocaine. You can make them with other neuropathic pain and analgesics and um, like ketamine, amitriptyline. Um, and so there's a whole variety of things that can be put into a cream form where they just get absorbed topically and can be really beneficial for some, some folks. Then if we have to move on to oral medications, there's um, what I consider, again, first-line medications. And that meaning that they have the most, probably, research studies looked into them in different types of neuropathic pain to know that they're effective. So we uh, talk about tricyclic antidepressants, which you may have heard of amitriptyline or nortriptyline. There's antidepressants that work on diff multiple different receptors. Um, so you might have heard of duloxetine or Cymbalta or venlafaxine and Fexor. And then there's the, another class, which are calcium channel ligands, which work on gab uh, which are gabapentin or pregabalin. So these uh, are probably ones that I go to first, and it's really a management of are there other side effects I'm trying to avoid? Are there other health dis disease, you know, disorders that I'm trying to not make worse? Um, are there coexisting depression that might be helpful to treat at the same time? So it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach for each person. There's also lots of other what we call anti-epileptic or anti-seizure medications that we've borrowed from in terms of pain control. And then sometimes we do need um, tramadol, which is not an opiate, but um, has some properties similar, and then opioids for really severe transient pain. So there are other options that are not, you know, typical um, pharmacologic medicine. So acupuncture can be helpful for some folks. Uh, massage therapy can be important. Um, there's a new machine out, which is shown here, called the Scrambler, which is kind of like a TENS unit, if you've ever seen one of those, but it's kind of like putting um, these little electrical patches, little stimulators, and what they're trying to do with that kind of on a basic level is the pathways that are used to having pain, sending non-painful messages through them to sort of reconfigure the way, all the way the pain pathways work to lessen pain. And that's a procedure that's done 
like an hour a day for 10 days in a row, and then every day a little bit more benefit and then hopefully a more lasting benefit. And that's been done in some studies even up at Mayo Clinic um, and been done in cancer um, and chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. And then, and unfortunately, though, at this point, I don't believe insurance covers it, so it's an out-of-pocket expense. And then rarely, um, spinal cord stimulator um, can be placed in the low back and uh, outside the spinal column itself um, to redirect pain pathways. And so that can be sometimes helpful as a more rare, you know, a more last line or further down the pathway of these other medications to control pain. So another thing that's really important when there's neuropathy is foot care. And so um, all these other things are important, but what can really sometimes cause real medical problems is when there's an injury in the foot that results in an infection or a sore that goes to the bloodstream or to the bone, can lead to you know, sepsis or bad blood infection or um, uh, bone infection that leads to amputation. So we really want to stress foot care. And so you want to report any injuries to your feet to your healthcare provider right away. And to avoid injuries, you don't want to cut or file your corns or calluses. You don't want to use chemicals on your feet. You want to wear shoes or sturdy slippers at all times because people with neuropathy may have loss of feeling and they don't know when they step on something sharp or they don't know when they injure a nail. They don't feel it. And, um, and so wearing shoes, out, especially in unfamiliar areas, is always important. And you don't want to apply direct heat to your feet and legs. You got to take a look and inspect your feet every day. So every night when you take your shoes and socks off, you want to use a mirror or have your partner, you want to look at your feet. So you're going to look for injuries like blisters, cuts, and bruises, itching, cracking, peeling skin, um, Redness, red streaks, warmth, swelling, any pain or drainage, callus formation, and any change in the shape of your foot to suggest any kind of injury. It's important to wash your feet daily with lukewarm water, and you really want to test the temperature of the water with your hands. You know, as neuropathy most often affects the feet, you may not be able to trust your foot in knowing how hot the water is, and so you want to check it with your hands. Use mild, fragrance-free soaps, wash gently, dry, you know, by blotting, not real rubbing, and uh, make sure drying between the toes and applying a moisturizer without alcohols or perfume to prevent that cracking skin where infection can get in. You want to cut nails straight across. Um, you don't want to injure the surrounding skin. You don't want to go barefoot. Um, you want to wear clean, seamless socks. Wear shoes or sturdy slippers even at night. Look inside your shoes before you put them on. And you want to choose good footwear. And that should be really lightweight. You know, if there's weakness in your ankles, it can make things worse by wearing a really heavy shoe. It may increase the risk of stumbling and catching your toes when you walk. Um, you want to have a closed toe for protection. Low heels and then laces or straps so that they aren't falling off your feet and increasing the risk of falls. So some other practical tips, you want to, if you need to keep the bed sheets off your feet if you have sensitivity, there's even some little handy little tent things that you can buy for about, I don't know, $10, $15 on the Internet that prop up your sheets so it makes a nice little spot for you there. Um, it's important to have balance and safety evaluation. Um, if you're struggling with lack of feeling and poor balance, there are things that can be done. Maybe it's needing a cane or some other assist device. Maybe you have such weakness that your ankles, you can't lift your feet up, and you might need a brace in the shoe. These things can be really helpful, and we know falls beget falls. So the biggest risk of having more falls is having a fall in the last 12 months. So getting assessed for that is really important, and having a fall prevention plan, knowing how to prevent these falls is key. And exercise is important. You know, you can't overcome neuropathy with exercise, but you can keep the strength that you have. You can learn balance compensation. And exercise is important for, you know, your general health. And so there are lots of places to find 
good information, as we know there's lots of not so good information out there. Some good resources for patients and caregivers, the American Academy of Neurology, Sharpe-Marie-Tooth is the most common in genetic neuropathy, and so their um, association has good neuropathy information. The Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy, again, a research organization, and then um, the clinicaltrials.gov provides any clinical trial that's going on about neuropathy worldwide, and so you can easily search for neuropathy and see what's happening. All very good, reliable information. All right. Okay, that's it. Thank you. I can answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Marman. Now we have about 20 to 25 minutes for questions, and I am assuming there's going to be a lot of people who are going to have questions, so we're going to pass around the microphones. We are recording this session for the people who are not able to come, so please talk directly into the microphone so that it can be, the question can be recorded. And since there are a lot of questions, we ask that you ask one question at a time. And if we have time, we'll go, get back to you for a second question. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm asking on behalf of my husband. Um, so who do we go to uh, to get the neuropathy addressed? Do we go to a neurologist mm -hmm. or what type of doctor to be no. evaluated? So I think, right, so it depends on... Um, who you're already seeing, if you have a good primary care physician um, and an, or an oncologist that you trust, a lot of the basic laboratory studies that should be done in all patients with the neuropathy, these should be glucose check or hemoglobin A1C for diabetes, a B12, um, and what we call a monoclonal protein study, which some of you will be very familiar with, but it's kind of a screen to look for those things like myeloma and lymphoma. And that, that's what the yeah, American Academy of Neurology and others would say for the garden variety or most common length dependent, you know, stocking glove neuropathy, those tests should have been done to exclude. Now, if we know cause, um, and so that can be ordered by, um, you know, your primary physician or your oncologist. And then um, if there's concern about what it is or how to manage it best and they need help, then certainly a neurologist would be a go-to person for both evaluation and management. Yeah, I've had uh, pretty severe uh, neuropathy in my, in my feet, mm -hmm. and uh, we live near Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and mm -hmm. some ads in local newspapers for miracle treatments for uh, neuropathy, and mm -hmm. I actually went to, uh, uh, to one um, done by a physical uh, therapist, mm -hmm. and um, it was the aerodyne uh, mm -hmm. infrared uh, fixtures mm -hmm. that they put on your feet and uh, turn up the intensity a little more each visit. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, from what I've read, it creates nitrous oxide or something in the blood. But do you have any experience with that? Uh, Can I ask you if it was helpful to you? Um, I, I really thought that it was for a while, but uh, about the same time I started uh, taking Belcade as mm -hmm. a, a maintenance mm -hmm. chemotherapy, so I was doing that on one hand and, right. and take it. So I, I really, I did stop after 12 uh, uh, sessions. I, ha I haven't found much success with it. I have found that people, like maybe what you experience, that while they're getting it, it's helpful, but it doesn't necessarily have lasting effect. That's what I've experienced. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning, doctor. Um, I wonder if uh, you have ever seen cases where shingles have um, increased neuropathy badly. That if shingles, shingles can cause neuropathy, um, and it is a, so in the area of where the shingles was, certainly you can get what we call post-herpetic neuralgia, um, and uh, that can be a very severe neuropathic pain in that region. Rarely zoster can also become more widespread and cause trouble, but most commonly it causes it in the area where the rash was, and it can be a difficult, painful symptom to treat. It can create loss of feeling as well as pain. It can. It does. It can get better over time. It can. Mm -hmm. um, when we're about done, and I've been... Um, 
uh, cancer free for 24 years. Yay. And um, <laughs> one of the uh, most uh, difficult challenges is peripheral neuropathy. Mm -hmm. And um, I've tried all kinds of treatments. But the last treatments that I tried was the, uh, the MLS laser therapy. Mm -hmm. I had over uh, 200 treatments. And then I also have been using the TENS unit. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, um, those haven't worked. Um, they've helped. Mm -hmm. They've helped, but it's not a... It's not a a fix. It's yeah. a very temporal thing. Is there anything else that is new out there that I can try next? Probably the, the newest thing in terms of any kind of device other than medication management, probably the scrambler is one of the newer things out there that I mentioned. It has idea of TENS, but it's different than the TENS, and they do it in the areas of where it's abnormal. That's probably the latest thing as well as the spinal cord stimulator trials which are being done more for peripheral neuropathy than they were. And that's really important to be involved with a, a good pain clinic and to really have a trial if you were going to do that before anything's permanently implanted. But that can be helpful for some. What do you know or your experience with the capsin cream, the mm -hmm. hot pepper cream? Yeah. Um, so capsaicin cream has been shown to improve neuropathy pain. I I tend to personally use the gels more often than I use the capsaicin just because a lot of people who try capsaicin, it makes the pain transiently worse. You know, you get terrible fiery burning before it settles down. And so getting through that stage can be challenging, um, but, but it is another option and it can be helpful. Yes. Um, <clears throat> sorry. I uh, had chemotherapy um, uh, and it caused me to have some moderate uh, neuropathy in my fingers and my toes. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked my doctors um, when I will get feeling back there and they keep saying in like years. Mm -hmm. So my question is how fast can a nerve repair itself mm -hmm. and how long do I need to wait? Yeah, that's a great question. So we kind of talk about nerves. In terms of how fast can they regenerate, it depends on where the damage is, but often in these uh, neuropathies, you know, it's down at the end and the nerve has to kind of regrow all the way and, and fix itself. The toxicity is, you know, throughout the nerve. And so we say a millimeter a day is kind of the um, number. And so it can take one, two years to see full benefit. Um, I have followed some patients post-transplant for certain conditions where I even saw improvement three years, four years out. I mean, it's, again, getting smaller and milder in terms of the improvements the longer out. I would say the majority over the first one to two years. Um, so I have a question about uh, one of the slides that you talked about, mm -hmm. uh, the symptoms of peripheral neuropathy where you mentioned um, lightheadedness, constipation, mm -hmm. difficulty avoiding, lack of sweating. Are these all symptoms that can happen if you just have neuropathy in your feet? They can happen with just neuropathy in your feet, certain types. So um, for instance, to think about amyloid. Neuropathy is so amyloid is a protein that can be produced by the bone marrow and deposited. That most commonly has a more length-dependent neuropathy associated, but it has terrible autonomic symptoms. So it can depend on the underlying cause, but there are certain ones that can have that. Um, you hadn't mentioned back-related or... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's hard to <laughs> Back-related or um, cramping sensation. Yeah. So I'm not sure if... Um, I figure it's neuropathy and mm -hmm. it's based on stem cell and GVHD because it's starting from my feet up mm -hmm. my leg um, and then also from my shoulders down to my hands. Okay. So, so anyway, addressing... Yeah, so it can be really hard to differentiate sometimes back pain and 
uh, what we call radiculopathy or pinched nerves or structural change in the back from neuropathy. That can be hard and neurologists, you know, uh, trying to make that distinction. I would say back pain that's truly causing often fixed lack of feeling, weakness. Often there's been pain in the back with radiation down the limb from the, the site downward um, rather than pain in the feet radiating upward. Um, uh, the EMG can be help, really helpful in sorting those things out when um, it's difficult to tell clinically because sometimes the back disease is so severe on both sides that it can look very symmetric and equal like a neuropathy does. But the EMG can be helpful um, in showing that, one, there's sensory involvement, which there really isn't on an EMG from a back problem, and two, the distribution. A back problem doesn't always, won't on an EMG often just involve what we call the lower below the knee muscles. It'll involve the hip girdle muscles and such too. So there's certain patterns on the EMG that can help associate those. Cramps can certainly be seen in neuropathy. Um, and, you know, most people think muscle cramps is a muscle problem, but it's usually from a nerve problem that patients get cramps. Um, yeah, they can be quite problematic. Uh, hydration is certainly important. Uh, electrolyte uh, balance is important, like magnesium, potassium, calcium, um, and checking those things. Um, some people find some benefit with vitamin D replacement with that. Um, uh, and stretching uh, is really important as well. Does that answer your question? Okay. Good morning. Um, you mentioned B12 deficiency. Um, have you come up, is there a correlation between vitamin D deficiency and neuropathy breaking mm -hmm. through? Uh, oh, there you are. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm like, I'm looking for the voice. Um, vitamin D and neuropathy, no clear association. Certainly there is with fatigue um, and uh, there are some associations with other neurologic conditions and the importance of maintaining vitamin D, but not a clear link between deficiency and neuropathy. Most of the therapies and treatments have to do with painful neuropathy. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can take to stimulate recovery with numbness? Right. That's a great question. You're exactly right. So I see a lot of patients who are on medication for neuropathy who have no pain, and that's not needed. And so, you know, uh, taking gabapentin for numbness is not going to bring numbness back. And so, unfortunately, at this point, there's no medications that restore nerve function unless it's in the, you know, rare immune kind where maybe we have to use an immune therapy for the neuropathy, but in, like, say, chemotherapy-induced, there's nothing at this point that brings it back. There are some studies that show some improvement with alpha-lipoic acid in diabetics, and so some patients safely take alpha-lipoic acid, I think it's 600 twice a day, um, uh, for neuropathy, and maybe some modest improvements in studies with that, but... Unfortunately, there's nothing else at this point, no nerve growth factors or anything that we have. I am wondering how a transplant patient uh, should get their physician to take them seriously when they report symptoms of a sudden onset neuropathy. Mm -hmm. My transplant physician completely discounted my symptoms of what, due to my efforts entirely, turned out to be diagnosed as Parsonage-Turner syndrome. Hmm. Yeah, so Parsonage-Turner syndrome is one of those rare immune neuropathies, and it typically is severe shoulder pain, and when that shoulder pain starts to get better, then it's awareness of significant weakness in the arm, and it's often around the shoulder and flexing the elbow, but it could be different distributions in the arm where people are more affected. It's a, quote, we call monophasic illness, meaning it comes on, it reaches its peak, and then tends to get better, but often incompletely so. And um, it can rarely occur in the transplant setting, or it can occur basically any time you change the immune system. Right. And um, how can you get your, yeah, doctor to take I told everybody over and over, and much later I found, looked in my electronic medical record, mm -hmm. like, two years later, and um, my transplant physician, who shall remain nameless, there was a little remark that, oh, it must be due to a, a disc I'd had, a cervical disc, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. 
a couple of years before, and I never had any treatment, anything whatsoever. Yeah. And I wonder if there's anything more I could have done. Right. It's, I mean, you're doing the right thing and trying to advocate yourself, requesting a consultation, you know, asking them to do that. Um, asking one of your other physicians if they're not, you know, I've had people do that, seek another opinion. Um, Personage Turner, there is no known treatment that would have changed necessarily your outcome. Some patients receive high dose steroids in the time of the severe pain, which has been mostly shown to help pain, not necessarily improve nerve recovery. So I don't know if you missed any opportunity for sure. You know, it's hard to know, but pain control, right, it can be very severe and often requires opioids in the severe setting, in the initial setting because it's so severe. I'm sorry. You um, yeah, I think it, it, I have not experienced it, but from what I have seen my patients experience, probably and mo a lot of patients, Tylenol might not, you know, be enough, but, um, yeah. Is it bad to be on gabapentin for a long time? No, there's no long-term effects with gabapentin. It doesn't affect your kidney or your liver in long term. So um, we have patients on it for many, many, many years. Yeah. Those, I have the typical foot issues with neuropathy, but I also have at least what I think the term is hypersensitivity to a lot of on my head, mm -hmm. like if the sun hits it or mm. like getting a haircut or mm -hmm. even if I'm active, trying to find a spot to lay on the pillow. Mm -hmm. Is that common? Is that lead you to anything else? Gosh, uh, you know, uh, sensitivity there on the scalp versus anywhere else or just there? Mainly just there. there. I mean, I also have in the hands. Mm -hmm. I have both numbness and sensitivity to temperature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that would make me think about small fiber neuropathy. Did it come on with the chemotherapy in particular? Or I didn't know? really notice. I'm mm -hmm. two and a half years post-transplant. Mm -hmm. I didn't notice it till last summer. Mm -hmm. About a year out was when I started noticing mm -hmm. this part of it. Yeah, it, that sensitivity to touch and temperature, and that makes me think about the small fiber type of neuropathy. Again, there could be many causes, blood sugar, vitamins, um, immune causes, and unfortunately small fiber neuropathy sometimes we don't know in about half of cases, but certainly and then chemotherapy toxicities could be a, a, a thing too. Um, often we test for, you know, those kinds of disorders and um, talk about symptom control if we can, although I know it's not an easy place. To <laughs> when it becomes real diffuse, it's harder. It requires more oral medications if it's severe enough to warrant it. If you, if, and if you can get by without it, obviously that's great too, but not always the case. Um, going back to how does nerve injury occur, mm -hmm. post-transplant, I was in ICU for 65 days mm -hmm. and came out with the neuropathy in my leg. Mm -hmm. um, is that a degeneration of the nerves? Is that in one sided that you have? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Did they say any it's other? It's a little bit on the other side, but mostly on the left. one. So um, there are such di uh, disorders, too, called critical illness, mm -hmm. peripheral neuropathy. And so we know that patients who've had um, sepsis or, you know, an infection in the bloodstream with multi-organ failure are more at risk to have what we call critical illness neuropathy. That's usually more of a dying back type of neuropathy, the distal degeneration type. Do the nerves grow back? Yes, they can. Mm -hmm. It's not always complete, but they can improve. Mm -hmm. My husband's uh, been about eight years post-transplant mm -hmm. and has a good bit of graft versus host problems. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned B12. Mm -hmm. The shots or the pills? It depends. Um, for some patients, the pills are enough. There's a rare group of patients or a less common group of patients with B12 deficiency that it's actually autoimmune, and they don't absorb B12 from the gut. So no matter how much you give orally, it will not get into the system. And so there's some tests when they test for B12 deficiency that they do for that. And sometimes it's as simple as checking and trying to replace and with oral and seeing how you do. That would probably be the most common, especially in an older group of patients. Um, the autoimmune phenomenon, they check for some antibodies in the bloodstream as well um, to see if those are elevated and then, um, then the intermuscular would be used. 
So it depends a little bit on the cause of the B12 deficiency. Most, for most patients, oral is enough. Under your practical tips, you have exercise. What type of exercise do you recommend? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So for neuropathy, um, I try to avoid uh, having people run or do anything, you know, really hard, you know, work on the feet. So recumbent bicycle, the elliptical for some is good, and swimming is certainly fantastic. Not everyone likes to swim, but that's the best, less least wear and tear on the joints. Um, but recumbent bike being probably second to that. Um, this peripheral neuropathy has anything to do with the memory loss or Alzheimer's? No, it does not. Oh. Would you recommend or have seen improvements of people who take gabapentin and Lyrica at the same time? I usually don't use them together because they work on the same receptor, so I try to maximize one you know, um, versus using both. I've seen people on both and, and anecdotally heard that, but I tend to only use one at a time. Um, so I guess mine's not so much a question, but just as a comment, because I'm a recent graduate as a physical therapist, mm -hmm. and I'm just over two years out from my transplant, my gait completely fell apart from peripheral neuropathy. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, was telling my doctor about it, and wasn't really following up on it, so I went out to an orthotist I knew and got braces for myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was extraordinarily helpful. And I don't wear them anymore, mm -hmm. but it got me through a time where then I could be more active, could exercise more, just mm -hmm. taking nice long walks because it didn't take nearly as much energy because mm -hmm. my gait was so much more efficient. So just to say it's probably just a short-term thing, but it's really worth looking into and it's covered by insurance. Yeah. So. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I said, well, chemicals on your feet, mm -hmm. and uh, you wouldn't be, I mean, like, um, Epsom salt or iodine that's okay. or something like yeah, that. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. We have time for two more questions. Anybody who has not asked a question that would like to ask a question before we do second rounds? Okay. So fatigue, is that uh, you would notice maybe at the end of the day when you're tired, or is it more chronic fatigue, or is there a Well, certainly in patients relation? with neuropathy, especially when there's a lot of pain, I mean, that's fatiguing, I think. You know, to be living with chronic pain every day, I think that leads to fatigue. But patients with neuropathy symptoms often, you know, after being, you know, you're able to distract yourself and go about your day, and then I think a lot of patients complain about it most, you know, towards the end of the day in the evening hours when you're finally getting to sit down, relax, your mind isn't otherwise, you know, pulled in much of different directions that patients describe more symptoms. So it can really affect sleep and then lead to fatigue that way too. Where can I get the, uh, the gadget to keep the sheets off of my toes? Amazon. <laughs> yeah, Amazon does have them. I, I look to see and kind of price it. Yeah, it's twenty. It's less than twenty dollars. I think it's. Uh, you might look at like foot tent or some. Uh, maybe a keyword. <laughs> but I, but I'm sure there's lots of other sites. But I know you can find it there.